right, Graham, for the sake of everybody listening, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Absolutely. Is there anything in particular you want to know about me? Um, my name, my name need- is Graham Aitken. <laughs> I, think, I think you know that much. <laughs> favorite food, place of origin, um, least favorite food. Maybe that'd be fun. These are good. These are good. Uh, my place of origin, which is definitely how I'm going to say that from now on. <laughs> my place of origin is Scotland, Glasgow, Scotland, to be specific. I was born there and grew up there through uh, like junior high. We didn't call it junior high in Scotland, but through kind of middle school, early high school, and then moved to the Midwest, to Wisconsin small town wisconsin uh, that's a whole story in and of itself but finished out school and then went down to the chicago area for college and that became home in the sense that we were there for like 12 plus years mm. that's why i'm a bears fan that's why you see my bears mug every sunday morning Go bears. all right uh favorite that's a painful or- experience isn't it to be a bears yeah. fan yeah it's a burden it's a burden <laughs> that you have to carry but it's it's one I accept gladly. The cross you carry. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, favorite food is, I don't know. I, I Like pizza is the only thing that comes to mind when people ask me what my favorite food is. But that that is somewhat true. But Thai food also, oh, yeah. love, love mm. myself some, some Thai food. Um, least favorite, uh, olives. I don't like to eat oh. olives. But aside from that, I pretty much eat anything including haggis for anyone who's heard the Scotland thing and they're, they're wondering about haggis. I have had it. It is delicious if it's prepared correctly. And this is like a, it's like a stuffed stomach, isn't it? Yeah. It's a sheep intestine that most of what you don't usually want to eat is kind of crammed in there and cooked up, but I don't know how they make it or what exactly is in there, but it tastes good to me. Um, There's a level of trust there that you got (laughs) to employ when (laughs) when you're eating haggis. Okay. So Graham, what drew you to Jesus to begin with? Yeah, I love this question. And I listened to Mike's talk not that long ago, and he shared a little bit just about growing up in the church and his social life being caught up in the church. And that, that was true for me as well. I'm a pastor's kid. I spent a lot of time in the church from the moment that, w- that I was born. So on sort of a practical level, it was my, my parents and siblings and other friends and church members that were very much a part of my life who, who kind of influenced me in that direction. I very much appreciate the fact that my dad is a pastor and then my mom to alongside him, they were at home who they were in the church. There was a consistency there that really impressed me. I know that's not always the case and I don't take that for granted, but I think their example and yeah, the example of my older brother and sister did really mm-hmm. point me to Christ and introduce me to the person of Christ. So there's, there's definitely that truth on kind of a practical level, but the, the other, the other piece that came to mind, just as I thought about this question was recalling I think like two or three different events in my childhood where I can really remember like for whatever reason that the details of each story don't really matter but being in kind of a hard place or a place that felt kind of anxious or difficult or a challenge that felt kind of insurmountable I remember two or three different occasions where I really did just in a simple way and in the way that I understood as a child talk to God invited God into a situation and really experienced a a peace and a calm that I could only sort of see as a supernatural thing because it wasn't that anything automatically changed or became easier or that school was any easier in different ways or, you know, whatever the case was. But I felt a peace that really represented Christ and Christ's presence Mm -hmm. to me. And that even even before sort of making my faith truly my own and and pursuing it with a lot of intentionality, I can remember a couple of different occasions where that was true and that was that was really compelling to me. What's the difference between uh, Scottish Church and the church that you ended up in 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 Wisconsin? Is that right? In Wisconsin, yeah, just south of Green Bay. Oh, that's a hard question. It would be an easier question to answer 
if you ask me about some of my other overseas experiences oh sure in sort of like the african context or the asian context there's maybe some more obvious differences in style of worship and that kind of thing the the british church or scottish church and and the u.s church there's probably a lot of similarities a lot of the roots of the american church denominations are in scotland and in the uk but I'm trying to think, I, I grew up in the Brethren Church, so that was mm-hmm. pretty conservative. Um, so where where we moved to here in the States, it was the EFCA, Evangelical Free Church of America denomination. Mm-hmm. And I think that probably would still be considered fairly conservative, but less so than the tra- tradition that I grew up in. So okay. that was like women had to wear hats the whole oh, time. There were, there were very, yep like music musicality and we we did i know you come from a tradition where it was all a cappella. it wasn't quite that but it was very simple the the musical offering was very simple and, and beautiful um but yeah i guess that would be the biggest contrast is that that i grew up in a, a pretty conservative tradition and it was less so when we moved to the states but um we also in at least in the brethren denomination in scotland it's like uh, there's like two or possibly three different services in the morning and then more services in the evening. So to go from that to one service just on a Sunday morning, that was a good time for me. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you'll, you'll have to bring one of these worship hats for, to model one day for, you know, I don't know, just what was it look like to wear a hat to worship? Like, yeah, cause we were told that you're not supposed to do that. Don't bring a hat in. <laughs> yeah. Right. Isn't that funny? It's uh. like, one tradition says no and one tradition says yes but no it was it was only the women so unfortunately i don't oh. have i don't have any of my own worship hats to offer <laughs> so other than hats what challenges your faith in jesus today graham <laughs> <laughs> who, who says i didn't love that uh yeah gosh what challenges my faith so again just in reading that question, a couple of things came to mind. The, the one was what is, is maybe fairly obvious, and we've talked about it some in the life of the heart over the last few weeks, but definitely I've had what I would still call the privilege of living and working in a lot of different parts of the world and a lot of different parts of the developing world. And there, I want to be clear right up front and say that there are incredibly beautiful otherworldly just yeah there's so much of the developing world that is incredibly beautiful when it comes to the the physical geography of the place and the people and culture and the vibrancy and all all those things music that you know yes i want to say that up front and also in some of those contexts i've encountered a level of brokenness and suffering and what I think could only be called evil, which again is not to say that that doesn't exist right here at home. It does. It exists in a lot of the developed world as well, but there's something just so palpable about it when you are operating in parts of the world where the spiritual realm is embraced much more in kind of an everyday sense. So in encountering things that you would call evil, I have experienced that at a level now and at a scale now that that has felt overwhelming at times and that has um, has challenged my faith at times for sure. So that would that would definitely be one piece. Another piece that again I think the youth and others will resonate with. It challenges my faith when brothers and sisters in Christ treat each other mm-hmm. poorly mm-hmm. and not just kind of poorly, but just in really awful, harsh ways and you know it's not that we can't disagree we can and we will and and that's okay there's a lot that can be healthy about that whether you're talking about theological beliefs or church practice or you know whatever it might be any social concern like we can disagree but when that turns into just a witch hunt and a a just tarnishing or or like dragging people's reputations Mm -hmm. through the mud when people are just sought after and torn down within the church family within the family of god that's that's hard for me to accept it's not the disagreement it's the way that it's done and that that challenges my faith for sure Mm. yeah those are the evil within and the evil outside of the church um yeah i guess i guess you expect to find it in the in the brokenness of the world you hope that god is is there in it but to then see christians yeah treat each other um like we're not family or um, almost worse than you would treat someone who's not a believer. <laughs> that happens. Yeah. 
That right, happens. and it's not, it's not, you've said that really well, and it's not putting the pressure on us to be perfectly nice to one another mm -hmm. always, or right. not have arguments, or not have fallouts, whatever, like that, that'll happen, but it's when that becomes weaponized and, and sure. really kind of, uh, there's, you know, when you've sort of stepped over the line from we're sure. family together and there's the ups and downs of that to just sort of a dogged determination to mistreat people and being sure. aware of where that line is. Amid all of those challenges, what mm -hmm. keeps you holding on to your faith today? So in a funny way, I'll, I'll start here maybe because in a funny way, it's almost two sides of the same coin where mm. the brokenness that challenges my faith is also something that, that in a way proves the, the existence of God and the need for God in the world and in my mind because the depth of brokenness that you encounter sometimes, the, the, the overwhelming nature of the suffering and evil in the world is, is beyond human at times. Again, there's, there's all kinds of things to consider within that, but, but sometimes it feels like it goes even beyond the kind of human domain. And, and so that starts to speak to the existence of the supernatural, of, of good and evil. And, and in a way that's, that's kind of a faith builder, like I said, sort of two sides of the same coin. And I think within that, given all of that reality, uh, the natural and the supernatural, I just have never, in, in all my years, I'm about to turn 40 in a few months, Woo! getting on, getting up there. In all of those years, I have never encountered a person or a story as compelling as the person of Christ and, and that God himself who made heaven and earth and everything that exists and holds it all together, that he himself would would humble himself and be a part of the mm -hmm. restoration and reconciliation through him, for him, by him. Just the, the compelling nature of that story. I've never found that anywhere else in other religions or other practices or, you know, whatever the case might be. And so that that keeps bringing me back to that central place, even with challenges of faith or areas of doubt or whatever it is it's the person of christ and and that story of yes god's redemptive work in the world but the fact that he saw fit to involve himself in that and to offer himself for that it's just this amazingly compelling thing amen amen i'm into that Now that you are rapidly approaching uh, midlife, I, I mean, uh, no, 40, no, you 40 years old. No, you <laughs> <laughs> if you could go back in a time machine or let's imagine you run into yourself today and you happen to be, you know, I don't know, between the ages of 12 and 18, what would you yeah. tell a younger version of you as a young believer today? I would tell myself two things, probably more than two things but at least two things. One would be that it should be, it can be, and it should be this exciting thing to explore the mystery of God. It shouldn't be this fear-based, gosh, am I gonna step outside the lines? Am I gonna get this wrong? Is God gonna be mad at me? It should be this really exciting, life-giving process of exploring the God of heaven and earth, who is our Father, who made us, who wants to be known by us, and who wants us to know Him. Like, that should fill us with excitement. And for way too long, when I was between 12 and 18 and beyond that, way too long that's felt like this fear-based thing for me mm -hmm. where I'm afraid of stepping outside the lines and and that does not need to be the case it does not and I would tell myself that and I think similarly similarly uh, along sort of the same line I would tell myself not to be fearful of um yeah that's maybe not even the best way to say it but there is such breadth and richness within Christendom within the life of the capital C church. Mm -hmm. There are a number of different traditions. There are a lot of different ways that people practice this thing that we call Christianity. Mm -hmm. And do I think that all of that is good and true? No, I don't. But do I believe that there is so much to learn from one another? Do I wish that that, you know, when you think about different denominations, different church backgrounds, Catholicism, Presbyterian, Lutheran, the, the, those are the more kind of main line, but within evangelicalism as well, there's, there's some, some different traditions. 
there's so much that we can learn from each other. It's such a, we're, we're mm. a big family and mm. each of us have, have mm. a piece of it, I think. And I, I, that doesn't need to be this fear, fear-based thing either in and out, all of that. I think it can just be, let's learn from one another. And so I, I wish I'd kind of had that posture earlier and I hope that I have that posture now. Um, and, and so that's one, that's one of the things I'd share with myself. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Any, any scripture touchstone that's been like one that you've had, feel like close by when, when you're needing to grip onto something from God? Yeah, there's two, I would say there's two passages that I, I would mention for different reasons. So the first would be Psalm 91. Mm. I had a chance to be overseas and work at a shelter, like a homeless shelter in Amsterdam mm. Mm-hmm. in in the Netherlands. I got a t-shirt there and I had Psalm 91 on the back. And so I, you know, I I wore it and I saw it a lot and it it became sort of, you know, one that I knew pretty well. And then, as you know, I went to sell books door to door during college. And that was one of the hardest, most challenging times of my life. Before Amazon, before Amazon for all your listeners, there was door to door book salesman. Right. Which makes me sound like I'm from 1850, but actually this, this, company is still going they're still doing the door to door thing and they're still making a fortune anyway selling books door to door i don't necessarily recommend it it's 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 hard people get mad at you but i had this t-shirt on and some the words of psalm 91 were were helpful in in that season for sure let me i'll read i'll read those first couple of verses so psalm 91 whoever dwells in the shelter of the most high will rest in the shadow of the almighty i will say of the lord he is my refuge and my fortress my god in whom i trust so in in those seasons that are challenging that feel overwhelming that the reminder you know i spoke to that early on Mm -hmm. in sort of childhood times for me of, of experiencing that peace that passes understanding and just that that sense of god as a refuge and a shelter in those seasons psalm 91 has been important to me but the other one that I wanted to mention is in Isaiah 58. And again, that's a pretty long chapter. There's a lot of really rich language in it. I won't read it all. Beautiful but chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me highlight what matters to me or what has resonated with me in my life with Isaiah 58. So in verse six, it says, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke? to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. And then it continues on. In some translations, it says, spend yourself on behalf of the hungry. And that line has always kind of stuck with me. It's not this idea of like, as kind of an add-on, maybe serve your neighbors, maybe serve those around you, your church, those overseas, those in hard places, whatever it might be, but actually spend yourself on behalf of others. Give yourself and your life sacrificially in whatever way that means, and that will look different for for everyone, Mm -hmm. but really trying to hang on to the fact that God has called us to live sacrificially for one another, and and it helps me to to go back to Isaiah 58 and be reminded Mm -hmm. of that. I saw this somewhere you know, Isaiah 61, where uh, Jesus gets the scroll from the the tabernacle reading and, or not, well, it's a synagogue, a gathering of, of Jews who've gathered together to read the scriptures and he gets assigned the scripture and he reads it. And he says, the spirit of, of the Lord God is on me, uh, preach yeah. because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. It's very much echoing that that concept that you see in Isaiah 58, this kind of really active good news that actually, um, you know, affects more than just someone's soul. It actually, you know, yeah. is a holistic kind of good news. I, I saw somewhere it's like, if, if your gospel isn't doing that, is it the good news? <laughs> so yeah. Jesus is self-identifying that his good news is uh, it's more than just uh, what someone believes uh, or where they're going after they die. It's actually a present concern and uh, something about the full wholeness of, of people that we're advocating for. So anyway, that's uh, right. That's right, man. You've, you've said that really well. And I think that actually points back to the earlier question about what I tell myself when I was mm-hmm. younger. Mm-hmm. 
that yes, the consideration of, of eternity and eternity with God and what happens after we die, those, those things really matter, but they were so front and center that we almost talked about nothing else. And, and in uh, reality, yeah. Yeah. what matters is, is both the, the now and the not yet. What matters is that yeah. yes, as God's people, we are called to be involved in transformative work in the here and now to talk about systemic problems in our world right now, to bring the yeah. gospel to full bear in our life right now, as, as well as thinking about the future and, and eternity with God. So yes to all of that, for sure. Preach it, man. Preach it. Well, um, thank you for encouraging our young believers with your faith and looking forward to spending some more time and maybe hearing about some of your travels. Because uh, from what I understand, you've been everywhere, right? Essentially. No, no, no I have. <laughs> I have not been everywhere. There's a long list of places that I would still like to get to. But yes, I've had the privilege of being in a lot of places. Graham, we're looking forward to it and uh, we'll see you there. All right, man. Thank you.